So welcome everyone. So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the fifth keynote at this year's PEPA. Um, so our speaker is going to be Peter Sestoff. Peter is the um, department head at ITU in Copenhagen. Um, in the 1980s, he was a, a, first a master's student and PhD student at DICU, where he worked on partial evaluation, especially issues related to compiler generation. He also made this book. Right. I don't know if you say it backwards, but OK. Um, so today, Peter will tell us about a partial history of partial evaluation. Thank you, Julia. I, I will share my screen and see if it works as well as in the trial. Um, and uh, go to, can you see this uh, PowerPoint slides now? It's good. Super. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, today I'm department head uh, and uh, professor at the IT University of Copenhagen. Um, so, what I'll present uh, today uh, is an overview of the history. Uh, First, uh, the backstory of the 70s, then what happens in the 80s at the Copenhagen University, where I was at the time, and um, and uh, some of the sort of developments I was involved in there. And if there's time at the end, I'll go back to the 50s, which has little to do with partial evaluation, with some, but something to do with self-application. I also want to put in a disclaimer here, so this is recorded. Um, this is much, much of this is personal collect recollections uh, not checked with the people involved and uh, I also haven't had time or know the resources to to check with uh, written records from the time so maybe this will happen later <clears throat> so the personal story is that in January 84 37 years ago I was a third year undergraduate uh, CS June at Copenhagen University I just finished some exam or other, and I went to the department, and there I uh, met uh, Mastrafte and other more senior students discussing a very bizarre idea, a program that could be used to specialize other programs and even specialize itself, which sounded like super intriguing. I was already at that time interested in programming languages and uh, self-compiling compilers and this sort of thing. And the backstory from my uh, uh discussion with the others was that um, some months previously, Neil Jones, who was the supervisor of Mass and later on myself, uh, the professor and uh, professor in the department, had been in Paris where he met Andrei Yashov from Novosibirsk. And Andrei Yashov had told him about mixed computation. And Neil, uh, who already was a very accomplished researcher at the time, got excited about this. And so Neil and some master students, including Hal Sonnakor, Sonnakar, uh, was started uh, looking into self-applicable partial evaluation during the fall of 83. And then when I heard about it in January, I somehow gate crashed in Neil's and Hal's work. And, um, and that led to the developments I'll present uh, here. Um, so what's the... Uh, story before 83. First of all, there's Klinis SMN theorem from 50, from 43, which basically states that if you have a function with n plus n arguments, there's a mechanical way to uh, transform that into a function or representation of a function that uh, where the first m arguments are fixed. Um, and then there's Futamor's uh, uh, seminal paper from, 80, from 71 when they put more protections. This um, introduced the concept of a partial evaluator in this talk called MIX due to the Russian influence. And um, the idea is, as you probably know, that if we have a program of two arguments, P, two arguments, D1 and D2, and the program, when run on both arguments, produces result V, and your partial evaluator, when applied to the program and only one of the arguments, produces another program R, so-called residual program, then applying this residual program to the second argument will produce the same value as the program uh, originally. And this mixes a partial evaluator, a program that specializes other programs. And the Futamore projections then are these. Um, Futamore uh, 
showed in this paper that you could take and specialize an interpreter with respect to a source program, you get a target program, a program that's equivalent to S, possibly in a different language. And you could even uh, self uh, apply, uh, if you don't have the program S yet, you can apply uh, uh, basically, if you don't have the program S yet, but only the interpreter and the partial evaluator, you can partially evaluate the partial evaluator with respect to the interpreter and without the program. And the result of this is a compiler, which when applied to S will produce the target program. And even if you don't have the interpreter, you can partially evaluate this partial evaluator with respect to that one uh, and uh, obtain a compiler generator which when applied to the interpreter will produce a compiler. And what's exciting about this is of course this uh, concept of self-application. We apply the partial evaluator to itself. A lot of work had gone on in this direction elsewhere. Uh, Turchin and the Rafal group in Moscow uh, had worked on supercompilation with notions like driving and results in program inversion. Andrea Schaff and Mikhail Bulyonkov in Novosibirsk and others um, had worked on uh, more or less the same thing, calling it mixed computation, uh, another word for partial evaluation and the reason for this name mix. And also in Linköping in Sweden, Jack Sandoval, Per uh, Malnuens and Anders Hals and Jan Komorowski and others had worked on uh, partial evaluation in the so-called red fund system. But as far as we knew in early 84, nobody had performed non-trivial self-application, so not realized these um, uh, second and third Futamura more projections. Um, okay, so what is non-trivial self-application? Well, it's always possible to make a trivial partial evaluator. Um, that's basically what Kleene has shown. You just bake in the given input. So if you are given a two argument function, power n comma x that somehow computes x raised to the nth power. And given n equals five, we can make a very trivial version, specialized version. Let's call it power underscore five. That takes only the second argument and it works by calling the original function. So this is basically what Kleene's uh, uh, paper showed in the uh, in 43, that this is possible. Of course, he worked with Gödel encodings and everything was extremely complicated, um, but um, that's basically what happens in, in that uh, paper. That it's possible to encode a recursion function that can transform the Gödel number of this to the Gödel number of that. But this is uninteresting from a, uh, this kind of partial evaluation is uninteresting from a, uh, performance point of view or from any other points of view because there's no improvement in computation speed or in program size. So somehow we want mix to the partial evaluator to use the given data five and do something useful with this definition of uh, the power function. For instance, a reasonable requirement or reasonable formalization of use is that the partial evaluator should remove all interpretive overhead when you apply the partial evaluator to a self-interpreter. So a lang an interpreter for a language L written itself in the language L. Um, if you apply mix to a self-interpreter and a program it produces a residual program, this program should be as fast as the, um, running this residual program should be as fast as running the um, given program P. Later, this was called Jones optimality of a partial evaluator. So our goal was to do something that write a partial evaluator mix that somehow made use of its uh, given data and therefore could realize in a non-trivial way these um, uh, Futamore's uh, second and third projection which involved self-application of the partial evaluator. So, um, and this was the collaboration between uh, Jones, uh, Neil Jones and Hans Sønderkorn that I uh, joined in early 84. 
We made lots of experiments uh, through that year, mostly working with simple functional languages and tried many different things. A language that's so simple and has only one recursive definition, uh, different kinds of data and so on. Also, we wanted the partial evaluator to be as simple as possible to, to, um, uh, to demonstrate that this could, was feasible and then uh, refine it later. Um, there's this analogy when you want a, a, a self-applicable partial evaluator, somebody made the analogy that uh, it's like designing an engine for an airplane. The engine has to be powerful enough to lift the airplane and itself. And it also has to be lightweight enough to be lifted by the airplane so infrastructure. Um, so uh, somehow finding a, a, a simple as possible solution here. There were many failures uh, through this process and also some despair, as you can see from the name of the Toupay uh, series of uh, useless partial evaluators. It stands for tomorrow's outdated useless partial evaluator. But in the fall of 84, we uh, actually succeeded with non-trivial um, self-applicable partial evaluation uh, using first order um, functional recursion equations um, and Lisp-like data with S expressions and a dynamically or untyped language. Specializing program points like Bujankov presented it in a 84 paper using annotations uh, for binding time and for call unfolding, writing a binding time analysis to compute the annotations and learning how to do so-called binding time improvements for source programs. Um, so, uh, and all of this is documented uh, in papers I'll flash later on. <clears throat> so what was, um, what was the challenge actually with this Binding time uh, stuff here yeah, and annotations. Why was this a good idea? Uh, well, it's fairly easy to make symbolic reductions in a language like uh, Lisp style language, uh, Lisp or scheme style uh, expressions. For instance, assuming we have a variable x is 2, value 2, number 2, y is 5, and z is the expression car of w. That means take the first component of w. If you have an expression like cons of x, y, then x and y are both uh, constants and we can reduce this to a, a dotted pair in Lisp or scheme terminology consisting of two and five, so simply a pair of two and five and this quote makes it a constant expression, a value of a constant expression. If, uh, however, our expression involves something that are not just values, we can reduce uh, cons x, y, x, z, to cons 2 uh, and uh, car of w, so x and the value of z. So this kind of thing is extremely easy to do with, um, with uh, abstract syntax uh, and abstract syntax and concrete syntax are more or less the same in Lisbon scheme. The um, Problems arise when you need to make decisions whether to reduce something or not. For instance, if you have an expression car of cons of x, y. So basically this makes a pair of x and y and then computes the first component of that pair. So since x is still 2 from the preceding page, that could be reduced to 2, but we might also be good reasons to not reduce it, in fact, but um, keep it as car of cons 2, 5. Uh, and even more interestingly, when we have a function call, a function applied to some arguments x and z, so we unfold the function call that is inline the function's body uh, instead of the occurrence of this expression, or should we leave it as a residual call where we still have the function call f applied to 2, the value of x, and the expression for z. And um, up here, it seems quite obvious that we should reduce it to two, but down here, it's certainly not obvious because the unfolding could produce an exponent, a much larger program, even an exponential larger program or an infinitely large program instead of this uh, expression. So these decisions, whether to reduce or not, could be taken online 
and that had been mostly the transition in partial evaluators uh, until that point, uh, based on the values of x, y, and z, and other variables that appear. So typically, this would be reduced uh, to 2. Uh, here, it's not so clear. But uh, then we discovered that applying an online decision partial evaluator to itself, um, at least it proved too difficult for us. Maybe others can do it, but we couldn't. Uh, so we either ended up with trivial uh, programs, uh, like on the preceding slide, or very large, exponentially large programs, or even infinite ones, so the partial evaluator wouldn't terminate. So that was basically the what we were uh, battling at the time. The solution to this was to come up with annotations. Um, and, uh, you know, Neil, Neil was the senior partner, and partner in this. I'm pretty sure he came up with this idea, having also worked with binding time engineering before. So the idea was to decorate all operations with either S for static, an operation that could be reduced during partial evaluation, or D for dynamic, an operation that should be left in the program, uh, in the uh, resulting program, the residual program produced by the partial evaluator. They weren't called S and D at the time, but uh, this is for uh, simplicity. So if we had, uh, we so we decorate all operations like car, the first uh, uh, operation that selects the first component of a pair, um, either with S or D, so car S is a static uh, car operation. It takes the first uh, element of a pair. So applying car S to cons S of X and Y will evaluate this to 2.5, two the pair of 2 and 5. And this one will then take the first component of that, which is 2. Conversely, the dynamic version of this, where we built a, um, first built a represent a program expression that pairs x and y will produce cons 2, 5. And then uh, the dynamic version of car applied to that will build the expression car applied to this expression. And then the various mixtures are possible. We could have, um, in theory, uh, car dynamic car applied to static cons. This will build the uh, pair here, yeah, uh, a representation of this um, uh, pair and then build a residual car uh, operation that is applied to this, um, this um, constant expression. So you see that the annotations actually make different results here. And then some things are illegal. We cannot have a static car applied to a dynamic cons because this, the result of this is an expression and this one expects a value. So what comes out of that, annotating everything in the language with S and D means uh, that we now have a two-level language with two distinct binding times. And this made self-application of mix possible, but of course not automatic as long as you had to put in the uh, S and Ds. So we invented binding time analysis, a way to compute these annotations. So binding times also called S and D for studying and dynamic, can be computed by a very simple program flow analysis. Uh, and here, they're written more or less like types. Uh, an example, if S, X is static, we don't know really X as value, but we know it's static. And it has a value at partial evaluation time, Y is static, but Z is dynamic. It's, we can compute, uh, for instance, cons of we can calculate that the binding time of cons of x, y could be static because both of those, are, uh, both of the arguments are static. Whereas cons of x, z would have to be dynamic because if this is an expression during partial evaluation time, the entire thing has to be an expression uh, during partial evaluation time. So a flow analysis for a simple functional language is not hard to implement. And that's what I did in some time in the fall of 84, to compute uh, the binding times. And using the binding times, one can compute annotations for uh, operations. Uh, function calls uh, is uh, present to some extent a separate problem, but again, the binding times um, help 
in uh, figuring out whether a call should be unfolded or not. Good. So um, these are basically the uh, secret ingredients that made self-application possible. But why uh, did this binding time stuff actually help? Um, so um, yes, I wait an attempt to reconstruct this. I also last week found some a handwritten note from 87 trying to explain this. I, I think we probably didn't understand this really in 84. Um, if we have binding times uh, and binding time analysis, um, then a mix actually gets three arguments and has two stages. So here's a hypothetical mix three, taking three arguments, a partial evaluator that takes a program to partially evaluate, uh, a delta, which is a description of the program's program inputs and binding times, such as SD, saying that the first argument is static and the second argument is dynamic, and then the first argument. And, and then the partial evaluator notionally worked like this. At first, we perform a binding time analysis and a two-level annotation of the given program using this description of the program's original input. We obtain a, an annotated program, actually a two-level program here called P delta, um, but it's just uh, no partial evaluation has happened yet. It's just annotated in the style of cons S and cons D uh, from before. And in the second stage of partial evaluation, we actually specialize this two-level program with respect to the given uh, first in, um, argument. Um, and now one can imagine some specialized versions of the of the mix equation from uh, Futamura, uh, mix three equation. We have for the special case where delta and the input description is SD, a single static argument and a single dynamic argument, which by the way corresponds to Kleenis, uh, M and N being one, both of them. So the first argument is static and the second, second is dynamic. Then um, the mix equation here reads that if we have a two argument program P, two inputs D1 and D2 produces the result V and our three argument mix when given a program, a correct input description and the first argument produces residual program R then residual program R applied to. The second argument will produce result V. Then uh, the photomorph projections look a little different with such a three argument uh, mix three. So the compilation now takes an interpreter. Uh, the mix three argument mix takes an interpreter, a input binding time description for the interpreter saying that the program here is static and the program's input is dynamic. And then it produces a target program. Compiler uh, generation will take, uh, now in this case, we don't have the program, but we do have the interpreter and the interpreter's binding time uh, and the interpreter's uh, input uh, binding time description. So we can partially evaluate the partial evaluator with respect to those two components. And then we, so we partially evaluate the partial evaluator of this one with respect to um, the interpreter and the interpreter's um, binding time description. And the partial evaluator's binding time description here becomes SSD because the first arc the first two arguments are static, the interpreter and the bi interpreter's binding time description, but the program is dynamic and not available. Compiler generator generation, we don't have the interpreter and its binding time description, but we do have the partial evaluator and its binding time description. So we partially evaluate this partial evaluator with respect to this argument and that argument. So this mix is that one. This um, um, is, this is the um, uh, binding time description uh, for this one. And the um, we partially evaluate this mix with respect to those two arguments here. So mix three and mix three's binding time description. And when we apply the compiler generator to Produce a compiler, we apply it to 
the interpreter and its binding time description. And if we apply the bind compiler generator to mix and its binding time description, we get the same th thing again. And see, so, um, oops, no, that's what's the wrong thing. Yeah. So since the first two arguments, this program and uh, the um, argument description are static, the annotations can actually be computed before specialization. So if you go back to the this one, um, in, the, in all the photomorph projections I showed you, these two arguments are basically static. So the annotation can be pre-computed, not really, not necessarily as a part of uh, applying the specializer, but it could also be computed by the specializer. In practice, we actually pre-computed it. So what happened in reality was that we pre-computed these uh, annotated versions, and then things look like this. So equivalently to the hypothetical three argument mix, we actually used a two argument mix that processes annotated programs instead of binding time descriptions and programs. So compilation looks like this, that the two argument mix actually processes an annotated interpreter, an interpreter where it's said explicitly that the um, interpreter's first argument is static and the second one is dynamic. So the program is known to the interpreter, but the program's input is not. And then compiler generation, we apply mix to an annotated version of mix and an annotated version of the interpreter. Compiler generator generation, we apply the uh, passing evaluator to an annotated version of itself, uh, this one, and an annotated version of itself, this one. And compiler generation and so on works on annotated programs. And here I suspect that it's, or you can see that it's uh, annotations of the second argument that are what, uh, that made a non-trivial self-application feasible. So what does this annotation say um, up here on the interpreter? Uh, it says to the interpreter to mix and specialize me uh, with respect to the program, not to the program's data. And um, I think this becomes uh, really important here that uh, it generates this, that the generated compiler should expect a program as input, not its data. Without the annotations on the interpreter here, one would try to generate a super ge general concept of a compiler that could equivalently take a program's input as argument and produce something residual that will accept a program and run it on the input. And uh, what we really need, take program as input and uh, generate something that when run on the program's input will work like the program. So I think basically it's the annotations on the second argument of Wix that uh, turn out in the end to have made um, self-application uh, feasible. Good. So I think this is uh, maybe the only original part here, uh, a reflection on why uh, what we happened to manage to do and back in 84, 85 actually worked in practice. And uh, as shown uh, by Sergei Romanenka, uh, later on uh, uh, the compilers generated this way and the compiler generator can have super uh, surprising unexplainable structure. The, programs were not only non-trivial, but fairly natural in uh, shape. Good. And um, so our efforts in 84 and early 85 led to this paper, an experiment in partial evaluation, the generation of a compiler generator by Joan Sestoft and Sunoko. It was presented at a conference, rewrite, rewriting techniques and applications in Dijon, in France, in the, in uh, May 85. Um, and uh, this led to a lot of other interesting contacts and developments. Uh, really nice one was that Uli Vidonvi uh, made the way down from Paris to, to um, Dijon and we met, met him there. And, um, and this led to a lot of uh, later contact and also to the PEPM series of symposia actually. 
Um, yeah, just to give you a flavor of the time, here's a print out, print out of the first international email I received uh, any, from anybody. That was from Olivier. It was sent from Paris, uh, Paris on the 15th of August, 85, and it arrived in Copenhagen already six days later after spending some time in, in Paris and uh, Amsterdam on the way. And you can also see that the university couldn't really afford uh, um, uh, ribbons for the mm, dot matrix printers of the time. Um, Hal Sonnegaard made uh, art out of a mix. So since a mix is a kind of fixed point for, for coaching, uh, you can apply a mix to itself twice and then you obtain something. But if you apply coaching to mix, you get coaching. Uh, Harold had this circular uh, mix, mix, mix uh, drawing. Um, after the, the work we published in uh, Dijon, uh, this uh, uh, generated a uh, surprising amount of interest, uh, of course, among the people uh, mentioned previously from uh, uh, Japan, um, the U uh, Soviet Union, Sweden, and so on. And um, in 87, um, there was a workshop uh, in uh, Denmark in the countryside uh, called partial evaluation and mixed computation to honor both the Japanese and the Russian uh, uh, tradition. Uh, it was a, a driving force, and this was Dean Spioner, professor at the Technical University, plus uh, Andrzej uh, uh, Andre Yashchaf from Novosibirsk, and of course, Neil Jones from Copenhagen. Um, it was the first time the Rafal group from Moscow was reunited with Churchill, who had been expelled from the Soviet Union some uh, years later. And so uh, I think there a lot of wonderful things happened during this workshop. There's a good picture from the workshop, October 87, with a lot of known people in the front here. Uh, Futamura, Yashov, Neil Jones, Dean Spioner, uh, Valentin Churchill, um, uh, John McCarthy from Stanford, John Hughes, Hans Halson from Lynn Tripping, Bill Shirley, Sergei Romanenko, Nikolai Nepaivota, and myself in need of a haircut out here on the wing. And you can also see Hal's mixed designers on the t-shirts here. Unfortunately, I couldn't locate, locate any of these t-shirts today. Good. This uh, led to a strong growth of activities and Neil's uh, Programming language group at uh, DICU. There's a member list uh, from 88 and some uh, prominent people outside the group, former members. A lot of uh, partial evaluators were developed in the group. Similix for Scheme by Bondorf and uh, Danvi. CMix for C, Logimix for Prolog, Lambda Mix for the Lambda Calculus. Other approaches to partial evaluation partially static data, finding time improvements, automated, and tons of other things. And um, and uh, then uh, Neil Jones and Carsten Gumar, who was involved in the Lambda Mix, and I wrote this uh, book um, with chapters by Torben and Lars and Paul, and uh, lots of uh, good input from Olivier uh, Tomvi and Reinhold Heckman in Germany, and that's actually still getting citations uh, now, um, 28 years later, and the full text is available from uh, my homepage. Um, a lot more happened than passive evaluation uh, in the group. Then we and Filinski uh, started to look into continuations and control. Lars Ole Andersen for CMix had to invent a point analysis for C, and I think that's the reason his. Uh, Lars Ole's PhD has cited a huge number of times, and there was much more similar work. Actually, another prominent C-pointer analysis also comes from that group. That's uh, the Anastin's course uh, analysis. Uh, it created a huge international network with many new uh, colleagues, Olivier, Fritz, Robert, Julia, who was chair of the session here, was at DECO for many years, and and Julia is now in France. Um, 
we live in Singapore. And lots of international research. It was really a uh, wonderful time to be a PhD student in, in the group with all these people around doing uh, cool stuff. Uh, one of the people who, uh, yeah, and okay, and one outcome, of course, of this, uh, uh, with the reason we're here today, is that um, there was this workshop in 87, and then and there wasn't really any international events for a couple of years. And then in 91, uh, Charles Consell and um, Olivier Danvi took the initiative to create the ACM Symposium on Partial Evaluation and Semantic-Based Program Manipulation, the first one held at Yale. So these are the creators of uh, our symposia here. Yeah. It has been held every uh, year since then, except in 96, there was a tax tool seminar instead, but Olivier Danvi was involved uh, again. And also there was no paper edition in 2005 because it had was held in uh, September 2004, I think, and it was, we wanted, the steering committee wanted to synchronize it with Pablo, and Pablo 2005 was too soon, so it became Pablo 2006. And Pepham has been co-locating with Pablo ever since in January. Good. So that was the uh, very uh, condensed uh, a history of uh, early partial evaluation seen from my perspective and the history of um, uh, of backstory of Pepham in a sense. Um, I just want to go back to this and, and talk talk a few words about Corrado Böhm. There were tons of international visitors uh, in at uh, TICO uh, in Copenhagen in these uh, years. And one uh, who visited uh, was a co-art of Böhm. And I discovered much later that he's done some super cool work back in the 50s, in addition to other things he've done related to self-application. So self-application in mathematics and computing is, uh, has usually been uh, employed to prove impossibility of something by cont contradiction, proof by contradictions as in Cantor's diagonalization argument 130 years ago, Russell's paradox, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and Turing's as solution to her own solution proof that the Entscheidung's problem could not uh, be solved. But there are also constructive uses, as we have seen, for Tamura's projections. And actually, as I discovered seven years ago or so, in the first self compiling uh, compiler. Of course, we knew about self compiling compilers in in the ages, but not that the first one was as old as 52. So Corrado Böhm is a prominent, or was a prominent Italian computer scientist, probably most well known for Böhm trees used in lambda calculus semantics. His PhD thesis is from, uh, uh, no, it's not ETH Zurich, it's EPFL, misprint here. Yeah. Uh, probably the second uh, computer science, science PhD anywhere in the world since Dave, uh, David Walker, I think his name was, had made one in, in Cambridge in the year before. Um, this uh, is not a new discovery that we made a PhD thesis. Knuth, Don Knuth and Louis Trapado wrote about it in 77 about Boehm's dissertation saying this. Especially remarkable because it not only described a complete compiler he also defined that compiler in its own language, so the compiler could be self-applied. And the language is interesting in itself because every statement are uh, 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 special cases of an assignment statement. So I found that was super interesting. So I looked up this uh, dissertation, uh, which we'll see in a moment. He has Brim at his 90-year birthday in Rome, a picture taken by my colleague Marco Carbone. I wasn't there uh, myself. Unfortunately, Böhm has passed away uh, in the meantime. So Böhm's uh, dissertation looks like this. Um, and as you can see, um, no, it is from ETH, yes, in Zurich. Um, um, uh, it's in French, uh, and maybe that's one reason it hasn't been uh, 
I studied so much. So I translated it into English and it's available uh, on my homepage uh, here. And I just want to give a very brief taste of what is uh, done in this work. The thesis is all of 46 pages long and contains 11 references to prominent people like Goldstein, uh, one of the uh, Princeton, uh, the IAS architecture uh, computer people working with von Neumann, Hutishaus in Germany, Turing, uh, Wilkes in, in uh, Cambridge and Sousa in Germany. So in 46 pages, uh, Röhm defines an abstract machine, a simple programming language containing parentheses sized arithmetic expressions, a lot of programs similar to state of the art, which is the ETSAC in Cambridge at the time, and a compiler from the language B to the language of the abstract machine written in the compiled language itself. So everything is done with a most fantastic economy. And it is uh, quite true to machines of the time, as exactly a thousand words, like most thousand machine words, like most machines at the time. Uh, each word is a, word is a 14 digit decimal non negative integer, which is also quite uh, similar to what was uh, feasible technologically. It has three address instructions, which basically take an operation, two registers or two operands, basically, and uh, stores to a third operand. And here's a uh, the architecture of the machine with a program counter, memory, and uh, input tape and output tape, and uh, an arithmetic unit. Unité arithmétique, I think. Yeah. Uh, it has uh, nine upcodes in the language, and each instruction consists of these 14 symbols. Upcode five, 5 is assignment. It has indirect addressing um, by putting um, a 1 here. It will store not to address 117, but to the address kept in address 117. This was also a novelty, not invented by Boom, but a novel idea from the Manchester Mark 1 machines much computer hardware was made at the time without indirect addressing. So this was uh, very clever to incorporate it also here. So, but it had just been invented in Manchester. The language has 26 variables, 26 program labels, a special uh, uh, program uh, variable P, pi, stored at address zero, an input at address one, and uh, impossibility or stop code, and a um, subroutine address there. Uh, and only one kind of instruction in the language, assign the evaluate expression E and store the result in variable uh, X or in the address containing variable X. So it's easy to program go to, just compute the address B and store it into the program counter pi. And here's a conditional statement if R is zero, go to C else D. So basically this is zero. No, let's see, if R is zero, this is one. One minus R is one times C, that's one. Um, so this is C if R is zero, and this is D if R is non-zero. So this store either stores either C or D in pi. So that's a conditional jump encoded in this language. And programs are, uh, consists of collections of labeled groups. A group is what we today call a basic block, something that begins with a label and has some, some exits. And the structure is described by control flow graphs, ending in omega, the stop instruction. And then there's a wonderful kind of literate programming, which Knuth described many years later, literate program, program anno 51 or 52. Since assignment is left to right, which was normal at the time, by the way. Assignment from right to left is something we invented in 56 or something like that with Fortran. And then programs can be right justified and the explanation which is written in French can be left justified on the same line. So the comments on the literate program on the left-hand side and the code on the right-hand side like this. So here's a translation of Euclid's algorithm, uh, which is in part of uh, the thesis. Um, here's the explanation on the left hand side and there's the right justified program code. And you see there are four basic blocks here. 
in the A, B, C, and B from this uh, flow chart. Uh, and there's a loop in uh, between, uh, between B and D, uh, as you can see here, loop between B and D, because a block B may go to B and block D may go to B. And this each group has a header uh, with a kind of pseudo instruction assigning the value pi prime to uh, address A. This is used by the loader in the uh, program. So it's impossible to explain all details here, but you can probably see that this is a super nice uh, piece of work. Uh, and uh, now I've translated it into English, so uh, non-French speaking people can also investigate it if they want. The loader program itself, uh, that's basically an idea from the Cambridge Exec. It reads program from an input tape, one instruction at a time. And when the loader sees a group header of this form, this particular assignment, pi prime assigned to A, as you see in the group headers here, then the loader saves the next program address to variable A. So the variables capital A, B, C, and D are basically used as a jump table at runtime to a jump to the particular, by indirect jumps go to the relevant uh, subroutine or basic block. Um, so jump targets are result at load time, not at compile time, and not at runtime. Therefore, the compiler does not need to resolve jump targets, and therefore the compiler that uh, develops can work in one pass over the input tape, as in the um, yeah, which simplifies the compiler, of course. A very clever uh, collaboration between compiler and loader. And here's the compiler's flow graph. Compiler consists of uh, tons of basic blocks labeled from A to N prime or something like that. All of this part of the flow graph compiles expressions with parentheses, and this part compiles expressions without parentheses. Um, and there's an NP here, I can't quite, quite recall why. Um, the passing was table driven using inter indirect jumps. So there was kind of five categories of input symbol, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, assignment symbol, variable, and operator. And uh, looking at just the last symbol and the second last symbol, this jump table with 25 in, uh, uh, entries is enough to pass parenthesized expressions uh, without operator precedence. Uh, this is clear and much faster than the Fortran parser, which made multiple passes over the input, because this can pass in one uh, passage uh, in linear time, a, a string. It was also much better than Ruti's house's um, parser technology from 52. So yeah, there's an explanation of the handling of parentheses. I think we'll skip this. Well, the entire compiler is reproduced in the thesis and uh, can compile itself. That's the point of this part of the talk, basically. So one can ask why wasn't uh, the dissertation more influential? I guess it's because it was written in French, like uh, at the people who is also Samuelson and Power, published in German. So a lot of early parser technology and compiler technology were not, uh, not used as much as you might um, expect. And also it must be admitted that Boom's a beautiful work solved what most people would consider a non-problem at the time, because it's actually fairly easy to translate manually expressions into code. Today, we don't want to do this task, but you want the compiler to do it. But the real problems that a software developer or programmer had at the time were these in 52, that the hardware was unreliable, so it would break down multiple times a day, so the name, same run had to perform, be performed multiple times, maybe even to check that no uh, error had crept in during the execution. Uh, there was no floating point hardware. So fixed point numbers, if you had them, were had to be manually scaled, which is really a pain in numerical computing. All inputs had to be encoded as numbers, and you had to do manual allocation of um, variables and arrays 
and of course manual linking of support chains to some extent, except for those fortunate enough to have a loader of the game which uh, by end. And also some people at the time thought that these beautiful computers are really, really uh, fragile and expensive um, mathematical scientific instruments. And the task of translating expressions into machine code is something any idiot can do. So uh, we should not use the computer for that purpose. Of course, we have a different opinion today. But it, the fact uh, remains that uh, Böhm's uh, work is really um, worth reading almost 70 years uh, later for its uh, brevity and uh, elegant uh, design. And also it's uh, way ahead of time uh, uh, parser uh, technology actually. So, um, and also uh, the first, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, example of compiler that can compile itself. So an uh, example of constructive self-application. And uh, with it, this, uh, uh, let me uh, yeah, almost end. I just want to point out that one of the uh, uh, Berm's uh, supervisors was Bernays, a mathematician, and he had some interesting other PhD students, Haskell Curry, Gerhard Gensen, Saunders McLean, Büchy, and Engler, uh, names that should be well known to uh, theoretical computer scientists. So maybe one day we should look more closely at uh, Paul Bernays. Thank you. And let me stop sharing if I can figure out how to. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so Kenichi reminds you that there was also Asia Pepem in 2002. Um, oh. In the historical list, I guess to you in one year and zero in one year evens out. Um, so are there any other questions? Thank you for a very nice talk, especially the part at the end. It was very, very interesting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you know the most of the story, Julia. If there are any yeah, questions, I'm really super happy. So, uh, to answer. so I had one question, like um, uh, you gave a good example, kind of inspiring example of how you struggled. I really like the 2A uh, uh, <laughs> uh, acronym. Um, but so in the end, you figured out about that mix should have three arguments instead of two arguments. And so I guess perhaps you tried uh, specializing in interpreter and a S and D and then a program and maybe it worked or something like that. But then did, when you tried the other Fudimore equations, did they just work by themselves or did you have to make an effort and kind of iterate and get things back to working somehow? Right, uh, as far as I recall, um, specializing in interpreting with respect to a program was uh, worked sort of very, very early and, and many people, uh, as I said, Neil had already started work with multiple uh, Master students, including yeah, no, Toby Moore. Once you realize that you need yeah. to put that second argument in there. Once you got it yeah, working, yeah, yeah. Argument, did yeah, everything I, fall into place, or did you have to keep working? I think, in a, in a way, so in a way, I, I think we the, the second argument is a, a, a post uh, rationalization of this. Uh, we we started with annotations, so annotating. We somehow discovered that we needed to guide Mix more in what he was doing, instead of having these online decisions whether to reduce or not reduce. And um, and so we came upon this idea of annotating the program to um, to uh, guide the Mix. And so this was kind of, you can think of a hack or something. Then we discovered that this was actually a two-level language and something that Fleming and Hannah Nilsson later on formalized uh, in a, in a paper in the in the uh, nineteen eighty seven the proceedings um, that we invented a new language there uh, and and so on. but I think these are, are post hoc irrationalizations uh, we're starting with a hack annotations we figured out that this hack was actually a technique not a hack and we could uh, compute the annotations we invented binding time analysis binding time analysis. Um, and um, and lots of other stuff uh, flowed from that, so it was uh, sort of a tinkering, <laughs> in a sense, uh, and and of course working with uh, Neil Jones and Hal Sunako, uh, 
uh, lots of ideas come up all the time and uh, unfortunately I have no diaries from this time or other written notes uh, so I can't uh, reconstruct uh, more precisely in what order things happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? So I had another question about the ancient history. Um, you said that Neil was thinking about binding times beforehand, is that correct? Yes. In um, what context? Um, Neil worked with uh, Steve Mochnik, I think. He had a, uh, even a, public, a, a, a Springer Lecture Notes uh, a volume called uh, Tempo, a language for binding time engineering or something like that. I can't, I'm not sure completely about the about the title, but certainly this was something that has been on Neil's mind before uh, the partial evaluation work. Like it seems uh, uh, Paul Van Nice um, has, even though he worked most, mostly in mathematics, he must have an extremely keen idea of um, paradoxes and self-application uh, mm -hmm. working with these, inspiring these um, computer science people. So I think Neil was in some ways primed to, to know this, uh, but uh, yeah. Ah, okay, so Sam has a question. I think he's raised his hand at least. Uh, waiting for host to accept. Uh, here's Sam, I think. Sam, are you able to talk now? Am I now audible? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, great, thanks. Um, that, that, was, that was a really uh, interesting talk, thanks a lot. Um, I was wondering, um, having discovered this amazing PhD thesis, thesis of, of Burns, uh, have you tried to reflect on how what he was doing relates to what you rediscovered much later on? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, you know at, a, at a very abstract level, there's some connections because uh, Boehm, I think, Boehm wanted to design the minimal language that could, in which he could express a compiler. We wanted to find the minimal language in which to write a partial evaluator. He wanted the compiler to uh, be able to compile itself on this minimal machine. Uh, we wanted the partial evaluator to be applicable to itself producing non-trivial results. So at a very high level, there's a strong sort of uh, connection in spirit. Uh, I don't think knowing Boehm's work would have uh, made the work easier for us, but except in the in the kind of moral support that <laughs> other people have been struggling with this before. I mean, uh, I wonder if if one could sort of do a rational reconstruction of of his machine based on what we now know about partial evaluation, for instance. Right. Yeah. So so when we had the. Uh, a huge benefit of working with, with Lisp S, X, S expressions, Lisp data structures, which were invented in 1959 by McCarthy. Uh, Boehm had to work with numbers and encode stuff. He, do, he did these encodings with amazing economy, whereas uh, previous work on brutal numberings, of course, are also super elegant and, and fantastic invention, but uh, but uh, typically represents more struggle than we, much more struggle than we have in uh, in '84 with just putting stuff together, uh, abstract syntax style. I, I actually I wonder when abstract syntax was invented. It's completely unclear to me uh, as a concept. Uh, maybe in the late fifties. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, also, uh, on a completely different note, uh, do you think there's any hope of finding those T-shirts you mentioned? Uh, I've struggled to find my, I, I thought I had one in my home, uh, but I've struggled. To, <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe other people can uh, can exhibit uh, from the list of attendees from the, uh, from the uh, um, workshop in 87, I don't know. So I think Oleg, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Oleg? I don't know, perhaps not. He seems to be muted. So I was wondering about more about the Bohm thesis. Does he, I mean, obviously when we look at it, we see, you know, only 26 variables, that seems a bit primitive and so on. Um, but when he writes about the compiler construction process or something like that, is it familiar to the way we think in terms of the way we think about compilers today or? 
Um, pretty much. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'd say amazingly so. Uh, the, the chief struggle is to compile expressions. Now, only one kind of in, instruction in the language, assign expression e to a variable so and so. Um, so that's the only thing that needs to be compiled, and this can be directly expressed in instruction number five, which is the assignment instruction. So the chief struggle is to compile expressions, and and here yeah, the chief struggle is basically at the time passing. Uh, mm -hmm. Passing is this big thing in the fifties. Uh, optimized code generation is a big thing in the Fortran compiler in fifty six, and this is truly amazing what they do there. But but what um, what um, BIM does is mostly passing and and sort of uh, straightforward uh, code generation um, for for um, for expressions. So uh, and that part is, is very similar to what you would ask an undergraduate to to do in an expression language today. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The Fortran Fortran compiler in the in the IBM Fortran compiler in fifty six has uh, a super bizarre uh, parser. Uh, but the code generator is amazing. Uh, yeah. A lot of work is done there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. I think we're at the end of the talk. Thanks, um, everybody. Thanks.